Hebrews chapter 10 says, and let us consider one another to provoke one another unto love. Everybody say love. And to good works. Let us consider one another to provoke one another unto love and to good works. One more time, turn to somebody and say, you got your work cut out. <clears throat> the theme of the Holy Bible is love. It's a love story. It's a love letter written from the Creator to me. I love that. I, I, I just understand that at a, at a great level. But it also gives us commands. More than just the Ten Commandments, there's a whole bunch of things that we are commanded to do. And a command is not bad. This is a commandment I just read to you, and you didn't even catch it. You didn't even get mad. You didn't even get rebellious, did you? But it is a direct command. I studied English in high school a little bit. I'm not going to tell you what my GPA was in English and grammar and all that. You pretty well guessed it, I'm sure, by listening to me try to talk up here. But I do know what a command is. And some sentences give a command. And that's what he's telling us to do something here. And the Bible is filled with go and do. Go and do. Amen? So church folks, some of you that just really like to cruise into the parking lot at the last minute, find your favorite seat, and relax and enjoy the songs and see what they're going to do next, you have a command on your life to go and do. And we don't want to run you off. We don't want to make you real uncomfortable. But we do want you to go and do. Because that's really the only way we're going to get through this next season of God in the earth. Is for the people of God not to just fill up church buildings. And not to just pour money into the black boxes. But to go and do. Amen. So, by way of introduction to what I want to share, look at Revelation chapter 20 and verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. Now, you can just be comforted in knowing that death and hell just don't have anything on us. <laughs> they, give it, they give up. They're going to give up. I love it when they give up because he's undefeated. Amen? So you, you just got to give up. And they were judged every man according to their works. According to their works. So for hundreds of years, perhaps more time than we can imagine, the relationship with the Lord, as has been presented by religion, has been presented in uh, primarily in, in two different groups. Uh, you, you've got those who, you know, tell you that you don't have to do anything. God's love is unconditional. You just accept what he's given for you, it's all done and finished and you just live your life and keep on living like you've always lived. Just live it with a different knowledge and different revelation, a different understanding of who you are and how much you're loved. And, and that change of your attitude and heart and understanding is, is all there is to it. There's no, nothing you need to do uh, at all. And then there's the, the extreme other side of the religions where... They tell you, 
that uh, you've got to earn everything. You've got, you know, you the harder and longer you pray, the closer and the better chance you're going to get of having good things happen in your life. And and if you're a hundred percenter in in church attendance, and and you you tithe and then give an offering and and then and then give to building fund and missions and the more you give and the more you serve and and you you really need to be doing and working and serving and giving and and if you're good enough you know you you don't ever slip up and say a wordy dirt uh you know uh, you you can maybe squeak by and just barely hear the gates pearly gates click behind your heels anybody ever been around those kind of you just seem like you never can measure up you know it's just all about your goodness your works your righteousness and it just becomes so judgmental and so self-righteous and and so much comparing each other and it just gets ugly and nasty and it can really weigh on you and you're like ah oh, oh, god won't do that for me cuz i didn't pray at all yesterday and no wonder i had a flat tire i forgot to put my tie check in Sunday and all this works and all this weight and the devil will beat you up and you get your kid gets sick and you go whoa what did I do wrong they said that to Jesus who sinned that this child is blind this is old stuff and I do it too I mean I, you know I had a man tell me one time he, he was a teenager and he'd been kind of rebellious and he broke his leg in an accident and his mother came into the hospital the first words out of his mouth was I told you you better get right with God that's love and compassion ain't it amen I don't know if he got right with God or not but uh, there's a lot of us think that way and it's easy to think that way because we we live in a capitalistic society we we we, we believe that we should earn what we get and and you know and and we want to do right by our children and we want to live in a fair and, and equitable uh, government and all those kinds of things amen but in God's economy it's all about grace it's all about his love and he what he's doing and if anything good is coming out of me it's because of him pure grace nothing more nothing less and you can't add to that but does that mean that we can just live any old way and that, that sin can continue in our lives? God forbid, the writer said. God forbid, that is not true. So our main text for this, what I want to share with you today is Acts 2.41. It says that when they gladly received his word, everybody say word, they were baptized and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So I want to make very clear to you today that even though salvation is through faith and it's grace that brought it to us, there is things that you must do. When you really believe, when you really accept it, when you really say it from the depth of your heart, all the stuff that you're going to do next is not a work of the flesh anymore. It becomes something you cannot wait to do. Today we're going to baptize Beverly, and she's excited about it. She's, she's, she's been coming since, uh, what, about six months? She's been coming back to the house of God almost a year now because we started back May the 15th or something like that, and I think you were here right, right about that time, yeah. So thank God, amen? And so today she's going to walk in that next step, that obedience. And it's not a work of the flesh. It's a work of faith. You, you getting baptized, you know, if getting people wet would work to get them saved, we could, just, we could probably do that. We could just say, hey, heaven or hell, get in the water and just dunk them and leave them, right? I heard one evangelist say, he said, some folks, I wish I could dunk them and then shoot them. Because I'd know where they're going. And I wouldn't have to worry about them the rest of their life. Amen? But that's not the ministry uh, uh, that the river wants to have. That's not what God's all about, just getting you to heaven. Amen? You've got a work to do. You've got a purpose. 
Amen. You find your purpose. Acts 11 is a good example of what I'm wanting to share with you. And it's Acts 11 and verse 12. And the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. And he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house. Everybody say, woo. Which stood and said to him, send me into Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words whereby thou and thy house shall be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. I like that. It's happening all the time around here. It's so powerful. Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. So he's standing here, and these people get baptized in the Holy Ghost just like the, in the same manner that they did at the beginning, and he knew they did. Anybody know how he knew they did? They spoke in other tongues. They spoke with another tongue. Now, that's strange to the carnal mind. It's like, what? I don't understand all that gibberish. That don't make no sense to me. That's weird. Well, just remember, that's how it happened in the book of Acts. And that's how you know. It's an it's a outward manifestation. It's an evidence in an earthly sense. In one place, Paul said, tongues is for the unbeliever. Some folks say they don't want to speak in tongues in their church because they're afraid unbelievers would be turned away. Well, if God's working in their heart, the Bible says that tongue would confirm in their heart. So you have to know by the Spirit what God's doing. And these they knew they were filled with the Holy Ghost because they heard them speak in tongues. But the point I want to make here is that in, in verse 14, it says, Go call for Simon, who shall tell thee words. I want to talk to you about words for a minute. There's an old quote that says, share the gospel and if necessary, use words. And I used to quote that and think, man, that's so cool. That's just, it really reminds us that there's more to this gospel than just talking about it. And, and it really brings, brings the point home that you need to live it. You need to show Jesus as much as you tell Jesus. But I kind of want to pull back just a little bit on that quote because it is necessary to use words. He will give you words whereby you can be saved. It's one thing to show it every day, but too many Christians are saying, oh, I'm an example for them. You know, I hadn't said too much, but I'm being an example. Well, you need to be an example and tell them of the goodness of the Lord. Give them words whereby they must be saved. Words that can save are powerful. We talked a few, uh, maybe a year ago, we talked about the blessing, blessing one another. We talked about how powerful we were going to be in a season where almost everybody was not really comfortable shaking hands. And there was hand sanitizer. Simeon calls it sanitizer. Everywhere, in case somebody shook your hand and you, you'd go straight to the sanitizer, right? But in that season when there wasn't many hugs and many handshakes, we... we talked about blessing one another. How, how good would it be if we stood six feet apart and just poured blessing on each other? And we talked about that Greek word, eulogia. Eulogia is where we get our word eulogy. Eulogia means high words or high praise. And how much more do we need to be giving each other high words? It's important that we say these things to each other. They say, give, you know, don't give me flowers after I'm gone. Give them to me while I'm living. And that's what we need. We need to eulogia each other. Practice high words. 
on each other. Proverbs 10.22 says, The blessing of the Lord makes one rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. I want to encourage you today to begin to use your words in your testimony. Use your words with each other. John 1 and 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. One of the ways you can give Jesus to the world is to give them words. Give them His Word. Most everybody can quote John 3, 16, but let's stretch it a little bit. And let's do 14 through 18. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son, the Word, into the world to condemn the world, we don't need to use our words to condemn, but that the world through him might be saved. Through the word. That the world through the word might be saved. Are the words you're speaking saving words or condemning words? But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. The name is Jesus, who is the Word, the Word that saves. You've got to speak it. You've got to say it. God lifted up Jesus as a Savior. God lifted up the Word. The Word has been exalted. Amen? Amen. In the story of Esther... I'll try to be quick with this, but it's, I think it's important to understand it. Let's look at chapter 4, verse 8. He gave a copy of the writing of the decree that was given to Shushan to destroy them, to show it unto Esther and declare it unto her and to charge her that she should go in unto the king to make supplication with him and to make requests before him for her people. And Hatak came and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Again, Esther spake unto Hatak and gave him commandment unto Mordecai. And in verse 11, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king and to the inner court who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter that he may live. But I have not been called to come in unto the king these 30 days. And they told to Mordecai Esther's words. So this was a very punishable by death situation. You didn't just go in unless you were called in. Then Mordecai commanded to answer, answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then there shall enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. In other words, God's going to deliver his people some way. I'm going to let it be me. How about you? But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed, and who knoweth whether art thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer. Esther hears this, and she says, I'm going to use my words. I'm going to use my words. Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast ye for me and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise and so will I go in unto the king which is not according to the law. 
And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. You and I have been called for such a time as this. And whatever fear has been holding you back, I want to speak the word of Esther into you today. I want to impart to you a courage. I want to encourage, pour courage into you. That if Esther could do this with her life on the line, you can do it with a little bit of embarrassment on the line. A little bit of a hurt pride on the line. A little chance that you might get rode up. If I perish, I perish. But I'm not going to withhold the word of the Lord that's in me. I'm going to speak it for what if I have been called into the kingdom, into my workplace, into my school classroom, into my group of truck drivers. I've been called into the warehouse. I've been called into the hospital. I've been called in to the rescue team or the construction job or the bakery or the coffee shop or wherever it is you may be going every day for such a time as this. You don't have to be real prophetic to realize this is the time. This is a special moment era in history and you are needed in the king's court today. You are needed to speak words of life to someone. Go and do. What needs to happen in this room and what needs to happen in you every morning when your feet hit the ground is you need to get a word in you like Jeremiah had in him. In Jeremiah 20 and 9 he says, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name, but his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. I'm going to tell you right now, God is about to set a fire in your bosom. God is about to put a flaming word in your womb spiritually that if you try to be quiet, it's going to burn you up. I'm speaking right now to somebody God wants to fan into flame the gifts of God that are in you. It needs to burn in you so bright that if you try to be quiet, you can't. You're standing in the grocery store and you overhear somebody say something and the Holy Ghost just gets all over you and you can't help it and you just hit them right upside the head with a word. Amen. Come on now, it's a flaming fire. It's shut up in us. It's got to get out of us now. Woo, what are you waiting on? God's not looking for celebrities to make this thing happen. God's not looking for the famous and the writers of books and the TV preachers and the people with big entourages to come in and bring a revival in a briefcase. No. God's got the revival in you. The word of the Lord is alive in you. It's sharp. It's quick. It's powerful. Let it out. Mm. Woo. I'm going to skip some stuff here. Somebody say amen. It was good. You would have liked it. Romans 10 and 8, what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth that the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. 
That's how you can tell. Something happens when you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. All of a sudden, you're not ashamed. You seen somebody really get saved? Woo! I mean, they might have to fight to get out of that seat and get to that altar. They might sit there and white knuckle the back of the seat in front of them trying not to go down because they're so ashamed. It's a shame that keeps us away from the altar. It's shame and, and burdens and grief and sorrow and, and disgust of our own life that keeps us away. But once you release it, once you believe in your heart, once you confess with your mouth, God takes all that shame away. He bore our shame on the cross. There's no more shame. Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. That, that opens the door for us to get rid of some shame and let it loose, turn loose. The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth. Never, my people will never be ashamed. The scripture that says God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind, that scripture in context is not about trying to get sleep at night. That scripture in context is not about being afraid of the dark or afraid of jumping out of an airplane or afraid of not wearing a mask in public or whatever. That scripture is not in context dealing with that particularly. It is specifically dealing with boldness to witness, boldness to share the gospel. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. So therefore go and without shame share the word of Jesus Christ. Now I want to drive this point home just a little bit, Titus 3 and 5. Because I don't want to anybody to confuse the message of grace in any way, shape, or form. I don't want you to think that we're mixing something with grace, that we're adding something to grace. No. Salvation from eternal damnation, plain and simple, is by the grace of God. Nothing more, nothing less. You can't, there's nothing you can do to make it any better or earn it. Nothing, period the same for me and you as it is for anybody else anywhere else but it says in verse 5 not by works of righteousness which we have done but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration by the renewing of the Holy Ghost which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior that being justified by his grace we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life this is a faithful saying and these things I will that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. See, when you really get saved, there's a real danger in just lining people up and checking them off and writing their name and saying, did you repeat after me? Yes, I did. Well, then you're saved. Go your way. There's a real danger in that. It's a damnable doctrine to make people twofold more a child of hell when you tell them that they're saved, sanctified, and full of the Holy Ghost and all done, signed, sealed, and delivered, and you send them on their way and you do not make disciples of them. You do not pr provoke them to good works. So we're a church that believes in works that follow and accompany faith. Amen? And I want to be clear about that. So he says that they may... Be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Ephesians 2 and 8, another good scripture about that. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You ever heard that? A lot of folks stop there with their gospel message. They stop there, and, and you've got to read, read all of it. You can't just stop there. And leave people hanging. Verse 10. Read a little further down. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. You got to walk this thing. You get come to God, get saved, get baptized. Amen. And you walk. 
You don't sit down. Nowhere in the Bible does it say go sit down. Get saved and go sit down. That's preachers that tell you to go sit down. Not the Bible. Hallelujah. James 2, 26, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. I don't know about you, but I've been to a lot of dead religious meetings, encounters. I've seen a lot of dead Christians. I've seen a lot of dead faith. People who say, I'm a believer. They say, I'm a Christian. Their Facebook profile says, faith, Christian. But faith without works is dead. One writer said, show me your uh, works by faith. I'll show you my faith by my works. Amen? Works come from a heart of faith. What are you doing? What are you doing? What good works? What good fruit is coming from your life? In Revelation 2 and in chapter 3, Jesus addresses the seven churches. What's the first thing Jesus says to all seven churches? Boom, 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 boom. Every time. I know thy works. I know thy works. I know thy works, I know thy works, I know thy works. In 2 Timothy, uh, y'all can go ahead and get Beverly ready for baptism. In 2 Timothy, my closing verse today, verse, chapter 2, verse 15, 2 Timothy 2, 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God. How many have heard that scripture quoted? Many times, Bible teachers, preachers share this all the time. Study to show thyself approved. Read your Bible every day. Brother Kent Mathis used to say, every day, 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 every day. Read your Bible every day. Read it every day, every day. Study to show thyself approved. Amen. Unto God. There's a comma there, and it says, A workman. How about that? You got to get it here, but you show it here by serving, by working, by doing and going and doing. And going and doing, and going and doing. Amen? Uh, so many people have it here, and a few have it here, but I'd say it's time that we all get it here. Get it in our hands and our feet and our mouth and begin to go and do and share the words of eternal life, the word of the gospel that saves. We have words that save. I say we give those words in a big way in the days ahead. How about you?